and I'm at the University of Bradford, I'm an honorary research fellow in the Department of Archaeological Sciences. Um, and I'm here as part of the Mesa Broadway project, one of the specialists, and my specialism is soil micromorphology. So I've come to talk tonight to kind of explain what that technique is. Um, it's one that a lot of folk in archaeology themselves are not particularly familiar with, and to explain how it's contributed to Mesa Broadway so far. So, I'm going to explain the technique. So, some morphology, what we do is take small blocks of in situ archaeological deposits, so ones that haven't been disturbed, not like a bulk sample where you're just taking a lot of loose soil. We have deposits that are kept in situ and we get them out of the archaeological material using a small tin, a mess of cubiana tin as it's known. And what we do is make a small slice from that tin into a microscope slide. And so we can examine microscopic features from those deposits using, using uh, a petrological microscope. And the important thing about that is that we are looking at deposits in situ. So it's unlike any other soil technique in a way. We're not looking at loose material, but looking at deposits like a, like a section the, on an archaeological site itself, but on a very small scale. So we can see how things relate to each other as well as being able to see what's actually the material in the, in the samples. So that's what you end up with from that tin, is a microscope slide that, if you're lucky, because this is a lovely slide from Nessa Broadgate, looks a little like this, and you can see the archaeological deposits built up on top of one another. So everything is as it was when it was deposited. So how do we get to that sample? We take the sample in the tin, we take it back to the lab, we put it in a fume cupboard. <coughs> Basically, there's a process called outgassing, which means that acetone in the food cupboard forces the moisture out of the soil but keeps the soil pores and the empty spaces, the voids in the soil intact so that the soil structure doesn't collapse. That, that acetone is then replaced by resin which hardens and we're left with a lovely block of soil in situ like so. And then we use various cutting and polishing and grinding machines back in the lab to take a very small slice from that block, bind it to a microscope slide, polish it down to about 30 microns, which is a little bit thinner than a human hair. So from that sample on site, we get less than a hair's breadth of archaeological deposits. And like I said, we analyse these soils using a petrological microscope, um, using polarising microscopy. And that's basically the kind of microscope that a geologist uses. And the huge advantage of that is that you can see minerals, structures of minerals, as well as just seeing organic and other materials on the slide. So, it's, so I won't go into it in any detail, but basically we use polarising filters and these configure the movement of light waves, they force the vibration into a single direction. And what that means for mineral structures is that you could, there are optical properties which are all different. You look at uh, minerals under cross-polarised light and you can look at the different colours and structures and patterns and you can identify rocks and minerals. And that's really useful for us as part of the, the micromorphology technique. We've got three different kind of views that you see. So plain polarised light, so for, for archaeological purposes, plain polarised light here, um, you can see the bone, you can see the charcoal, you can see the colours and different soil structures, just as you kind of would on site, only hugely magnified. Cross polars, all that stuff disappears, we can't see it, it's isotropic. Um, what we can see instead are those white minerals that you can see there, you know, there's no, there's no structure or definition to them. And across polars, we can see what they are, we can identify different rock types. The third light source we use is a peak incident light, which means shining a different light source onto the slide. And the real use of that for archaeology is that we can see things that have been heated. So a nice brown, sort of, you know, typical soil profile like that. If some of those soil areas have been heated, rubified as we call it, in a bleak incident light, that will really show up. So you put all those three sort of views together and you get a really good way of understanding what's going on in the deposit. So what can we see? We'll run through the kind of things we would see down the microscope. The classic indicator, I suppose, we were on site and we see all those lovely dark, charcoal half hearty deposits the black stuff, which obviously unless you get a nice big lump of charcoal or, or peat, you can't really see what they are. Under the microscope we can. So the classic difference for, my, for micromorphologists who've got the nice cell structure of say a piece of wood charcoal versus that sort of stringy peaty structure. There's lots of experimental archaeology uh, stuff done using micromorphology where we kind of truth all this stuff. We kind of burn stuff if we know what it is, we see what it looks like under the microscope. 
Um, another one, classic one is turf. So turfy sods taken to burn in the fires. It all looks the same on site, but under the microscope, a lot of the time you can see all those mineral particles from the sort of top soil structures in among the burn material. And then switch to cross polar so we can see mineral structures and we can see ash. Now in the soil, in, in the actual soil structure, you can't really see that standing out. We switch to cross polars and we can see the mineral from the ash, all the organic material is gone, we've just got that ashy mineral left. We can see that under the microscope. More organic features, bone, obviously we can see bone on site, but under the microscope we can see structures, we can see levels of degradation, we can see where bone has maybe been enriched by iron, it changes colour, we can think about soil processes and where that bone has been and whether things are redeposited. Using the oblique incident light, we can see whether it's been heated. So again, another set of information to add to the stuff that we see on site itself. Just to come back a bit to this difference between plain polarised and cross polarised lights, it's not just about identifying rocks and minerals. We see here are a pair of slides, plain polarised, cross polarised, and the same here. I don't know how well you can see this, but under plain polarised light, we see a big rock fragment and a piece of bone. We switch to cross polars, we can not only identify this mineral, it's a piece of limestone from a cave in the sky. We can see that there's just a little bit of that birefringence, that, that little light from minerals coming through in the cross polarised light. So that bone's pretty well preserved. This is a limestone case, we might expect that. We can see, still see some of the mineral structure within the bone. Likewise, here we've got a nice charcoal rich deposit with this funny browny smear through it. We turn to cross, uh, cross polarised light and we can see that that's, that's a little layer of ash there. All the charcoal, other bits that we can see in plain polarised light, we can't see anymore. So you can see how you can kind of toggle between the two and you try and get a full picture of what's going on. More organic features, obviously done the microscope, you can see a lot more detail. Um, there's a nice piece of wood next to a piece of charcoal, different colours, different structures, burning. A root fragment, you can see there's a tuberose root fragment there, lots of little starch grains. More burnt structures there, but under the microscope we can see that there are some fungal sclerotia, which are basically associated with decaying dead wood. Roots, nice bit of peat, unburned peat. Under the microscope we can really see that peat structure, we can see whether there are fungal features, spores, pollen, mixed up with it. Again, helping with identification. That little lump there is from Kelsey Caves excavation, which is in the Murray Firth. Um, Lovely little cave site, lots of nice clear features in the slides because there's not actually much soil structure there, just, just the minerals, just these sort of sandy cave deposits. I don't know if you can see that there, but there's a little hairy insect leg. This is probably about, oh, I don't know, a quarter of a millimetre long, um, this little deposit there. Lots of those in, tiny little bits of insect features. We worked out in the end, they were probably bat droppings. So we've got little bat coprolites. So yeah, you can see how you can add to the information we can get from excavation. Other features you might see, silica features. Again, because we're using this technique that allow, allows us to see mineral structures, we can tell a lot more about features such as these. Silica features, phytoliths, diatoms, and sponge spicules, those kind, kinds of things. Again, important indicators in archaeology. There's a whole area of archaeological science um, that's devoted to phytolith. Um, analysis. Phytoliths are silica structures found in plants, and different plants make different structures. So you have cereal phytoliths, grass phytoliths. So again, it's a really important environmental archaeology indicator. We can see them under the microscope in soil micromorphology. We sometimes can't identify them. Remember, we're looking at that sort of 30 micron thick slice. You know, you can't make an identification. Same goes for charcoal. But, but we can put them in context which is what the phytolith analysis on its own can't do where you extract stuff. We can look at it in context. Same for diatoms. Diatoms, again, silica structures associated with watery damp conditions. We see them in peat, for example. Again, we can see these under the microscope. These sponge spicules, obviously marine, marine features. Um, this is from the site at Mir on Sunday, the Mir Burnt Mound. Um, some of the sort of early deposits and in fact, identifying these sponge spicules helped to show where the sea level where we were getting seawater coming into the deposit. Um, what other things can we see? Products, 
in a similar way that we look at a thin section of soil, we can look at a thin section of pottery. This is a pottery fragment mounted on the thin section. The same principle, we can look at the temper that's in the pottery, we can look at heating, and we can look at the structure of the pot overall. Um, this is a mortar fragment <coughs> cross colours. So the calcium carbonate, the lime structure holding the mortar piece together, really shows up so we can identify that. This is a little metal sort of droplet from Theatre Royal in York. Can't see the metal itself, that's isotropic, we can't, we can't use the polarised light to see through it or see any structures really, but we can see the real heating around that little globule of metal. And this here, this is another one from Murrow and Sandy actually, um, a little vitrified fragment. So, see when you heat things to a high temperature you get vitrefaction, sort of glass bubbly sort of things, like heating to a very high temperature. Under the microscope sometimes you can see that happening in soils where you've got sort of very small mineral elements going, going through that process and other bits and bobs happening around it. You can really tell from that kind of shape, that glassy, bubbly shape, that something's been heated to a high temperature. And then we've got rock and mineral identification. As I was saying, um, this is a really important part of soil micromorph. Um, here's an example again from the site in Sky that I was sort of showed some slides from earlier. You can see there on that slide that we've got two different deposits, which is fine. But looking at the rocks and minerals under the microscope, what we could also do is, um, is see that not only do you have different deposits, but you have different rock types in there. So it really shows that these two different deposits aren't just different in terms of the archaeology. They've come from different places as well. So these two upper slides here, um, are limestone and then these are granitic granite type fragments all through the lower deposit there. And this is quite important for the Nessa Bronca um, because we have the situation of the rocks that don't belong. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Martha Johnson's work at the Nessa Bronca, um, our geologist. Um, as we know, the rocks, the rock types in use at the Nessa Bronca are mainly sandstone. The buildings are sandstone buildings. Um, but what we keep finding, what Martha keeps finding on site, are rocks that don't belong. Not sandstones, but dike rocks, volcanic rocks from some of the volcanic sills that run through the open geology. So they're not local to the Nest Brodga, these foreign rocks, um, but we find them everywhere within the structures. They're not worked. Um, Martha's hand there is holding one of the many rocks that she's now identified as being used. She's showing that today. It's a little piece of cantonite, one of the, these volcanic rock types that's been used as, as a whetstone or polisher. Um, so we have volcanic dike rock deliberately brought to the Nest Brodga, not, not used, uh, not, not worked, but used and brought there for some specific purpose. So we see that all around the site. We see it in macro, we've got lumps of it. One of the things that we've been focusing on with our micromorphology project is trying to see that under the microscope. It's very easily identifiable. Here in cross polars, obviously, we've got a couple of these volcanic, this is a basalt fragment, which actually seems to be part of a piece of pottery. And then there's another volcanic, you can really see that volcanic shape. It's, you know, it's a really distinctive thing. So we can identify these under the microscope and add another dimension, hopefully, to the work that Martha's been doing. Why are they bringing these rocks to Ness? We don't know, really. Um, whether, and if we can see them under the microscope and see whether, where they are, hopefully that will help us understand that a little bit more. So what other indicators do we have? So again, running through you know, what we see under the microscope. Um, stepping away from the archaeology a little bit, we've got evidence for past processes environmental indicators, um, lots of things. We could spend a long time talking about all the different things we see under the microscope, not just the, you know, the, not just the indicators themselves, the inclusions that come from archaeology, but the soil processes that change them, um, soil processes on their own, we could, we could be here all night, but basically some, some basics. Um, iron movement is a big one. You see that whole slide there and you can see where that crack um, Pre-thaw processes, you've got, you've got some clay material at the bottom, some more organic sort of mixed archaeological deposit, and a big crack through it. And basically, water movement down the profile through time has resulted in that iron accumulation around that large crack. 
So seeing things like that is quite important. We want to know what's happened to our archaeological deposits. We want to know whether they've been subject to a lot of water movement. We want to know whether they've been disturbed or whatever. Um, so it's not just about seeing the things that we know are the result of human activity, but about seeing in the, in, under the microscope, seeing the processes that will have shaped the way they look to us today, how they got there. Biological activity is another big one. We've got a nice um, reworked soil profile here. So instead of seeing this kind of nice kind of dense soil material, you know, your minerals and organics all together, nice little soil profile, we've got one here that just looks like a lot of pixel, pixels, basically. It's been entirely reworked by worms. That's a lot of worm poo, basically. That <coughs> there is just all worm poo. Um, and you can see various little organic bits and bobs in there. So not surprising that the worms had a feast on that particular soil. Well, archaeologists can, can see that, we can feel that when we're digging it. But it's useful to see these things. You can see under the microscope here, again, two different soil areas, two different deposits. We don't quite know what's happened here, but there's a crack down there that, again, is filled with these little worm excrement. So what we can say, the first thing we can say about deposits like these, they've been disturbed, they've been reworked. Soil fauna have worked on them. If we were to find the, the, the things that we were to find in these deposits, would possibly be slightly disturbed. Um, another big one is clay movement. In the same way that iron moves down a soil profile when it, when when there is water coming through it, which is pretty much all the time in Scotland, um, you don't just get iron moving down the profile; you get clay, um, fine clay, the fin finest finest parts of the soil, the soil material. They're dislodged from between the larger rock fragments and they move down profile and they accumulate at areas where someone, something stops them, maybe it's a denser soil or a soil, part of the soil profile or a rock or whatever and the clay will accumulate. So you get these little clay accumulations there. It can also point to disturbance in the soil profile. People um, working on things, cultivation especially, lots and lots of these kind of features are a good, a good indicator for cultivation. Um, Basically, when we go into cross polars, they can look really pretty because these clay, these tiny clay particles, when they settle out in the soil profile, the clay particles align in a certain way. And if they're all aligned, just parallel to one another, it <coughs> acts like one big crystal. And so you get that lovely birefringence, that lovely kind of colour coming through, all this big, big one big thing. So, so yeah, past processes. And there are unique to micromorphology in a way. And again, these things have been truthed by a lot of experimental archaeology and looking at a lot, a lot of slides, basically. One of these phosphate, particular phosphate type features. Um, we can't see this when we're digging at all, but um, phosphatic, um, very organic materials, down, bone, offal, you know, anything very organic that goes into soil, it's got a lot of phosphorus in it, phosphate. Um, and when that degrades, it's held in the soil. It isn't cycled out like a lot of other, other um, parts of the soil chemistry. So it's a really good archaeological indicator. We use, we use phosphate to tell us that there's been a lot of human activity in an area to identify sort of activity areas. Um, but we can see that micromorphologically. We can see um, amorphous phosphate shows up um, under the microscope as this kind of lovely orangey jelly type stuff. So you can see that there. Um, we also see when bone is degrading, there's a particular kind of feature, a particular kind of way that bone degrades. The bone chemistry degrades in such a way as we get what are called calcium ion phosphate paired of features, soil features. You can just see them there, you can see through there, and this is a really good one. And you get these little radial kind of fucking sunburst lumps. It looks absolutely amazing. Seeing those, you know there's been bone in this soil that has degraded. You can't see the bone anymore, but you can see these features. So really uniquely useful things that morphology can tell us. Another one that's a bit like that is identifying down. Um, see in this little, little um, slide up here, you've got um, you've got what looks like some maybe some unburnt peach, just a little sort of spread of organic material there. We're going turning into cross polars. We can see that um, through going, you can't, you can't see the organics there, this goes dark. You can see obviously the minerals showing up um, under cross polars. But you can see, you probably can't see them so well here, 
there's a couple in this, this magnified example, things called calcitic spherulites. And these are just little, little features, little, little mineral features that are created in the gut of herbivores. And they come out in the poo. And they show up as what looks like, almost like a little, little four-leaf clover shape, really nice bright little things. Quite hard to take photographs of because they're so small, even at micromorphology standards, they're absolutely tiny, about 20 microns across. Um, and we can see them under the microscope. So we know, for example, that that little spread of stuff there, it isn't a, piece, a bit of peat, it's herbivore done. And again, that's from the Council Cave excavations. So all these indicators that we can see under the microscope, but the really good thing about micromorphology is you're not seeing them just in, in isolation from each other. You see the whole thing together. So you can make the story, you can look at the different layers and the features in them and the processes they've gone through, and you can build that all up. Here's a lovely slide from Structure 1 of the Nest Brodger, which we're finally going to talk about in a minute, I assure you. Um, Half-dried material, you can see the charcoal and the piece there. Occupation material, not quite so much charcoal in it, but down and bone, bits and bobs. Another half hearthy kind of fuel-rich level. Then we've got floor construction layer, which we're going to talk a bit about. Um, occupation lenses, at least 14, about that much, there's at least 14 different episodes in that, in that one slide there. Different events happening within the structure one. So this brings us to Nest Frogge and what we've been doing in Nestor. I hope, hope that kind of gets across the kind of things we're looking at. So, Nestor Brodger, we've been doing micromorphology, micromorphological sampling since 2013, and we've taken over 100 samples. They're quite expensive to process. We won't be processing all of them, I should think. Um, the key thing is, is working with the excavation. I've certainly taken samples, I think. We'll probably get a better version of that, but we take as we go along because we don't know what's going to happen next. Um, uh, alongside the samples, I take little bulk samples that I can then use for ge geochemistry to answer particular questions about that, that, that side. Samples taken with all the, within all the key buildings, all the key structures, and the midden sequences that we have in trench T, and also those that are within the main trench where the main structures are. And we've taken samples through the floor surface, occupation, deposit sequences. This is one of them in structure one, where you've got the floor construction and the remains of the activity that happened on that, on that floor. And then other samples through materials of specific interest, wall core material, clay rich material that came off, possibly came off the roof of structure 14, and lots of different little bits and bobs. So far, we've only managed to, we've only, we've only got to say we've processed a, a relatively small amount of these. And this is how it looks in the main trench. Samples through floor occupation sequences, half deposits. Um, the most samples we have is from structure eight. We've got pretty equal amounts of samples from the other structures, slightly fewer from structure ten, where the sequence has been a bit more complex. Um, and we've processed a few from each of these structures. The most we've processed has been from structure fourteen. That <coughs> that uh, building has finished being excavated now. And that's one of the structures that we're looking at in detail for the interim report that's happening at the moment. So this is how the sampling looks. It looks slightly unbalanced in some structures because it's responding to the excavation structure right here. Certain areas, less sample disturbance, um, things being truncated, me not being able to get into areas, areas that are you know, slightly excavated or phase, whatever, you respond to the excavation. The red of samples we've taken and the yellow of samples we've processed from each of these structures. Um, structure one. Later phase of structure one, we've got a really good sample set that has been a focus of excavation over the last few years. So structure one goes all the way around there. The later phase of structure one, you've got this secondary wall, turning it into a slightly more circular building. So, later phase samples from structure one in 2017-18. Oh, no, that's a good, that's a better view of what that later phase building looked like. Um, and then from 2017-2018, this is from 2018, the, that secondary phase wall was removed and you can now see all the structure one, the, the uh, early phase of it, and we've started extending the sampling out into that area as well. You can see from the yellow samples, though, that we've, that we've got through there, um, 
we were sampling through the secondary phase, but that group of samples we processed, three of these samples, and you can see that they go through, and this is kind of what gave Fook a window into just how much phase there might be to structure one. Um, you can see secondary phase, floors, occupation, and then you go right down, and we would think that the lower samples actually represent that early phase that's now being excavated. Structure 14, fewer samples, mainly in sondages going through the, um, through the occupation floors. Fewer samples, less depth, certainly by the time I started taking samples on site, and a few other pit features and various bits and bobs, and of course the halves. And then in trench T, now we've got this lovely building revealed in trench T, but before that there were loads and loads of mineral deposits, which you can just see in the sections there. That's 2018. Before they were all removed, we've taken lots and lots of sam samples. We need to focus on the features that are within these deposits, all the chart and the bone and everything else, and to compare them perhaps to the material that's coming out of the structures themselves. And this work follows on from some work done by Dr. Lisa Marie Schulte, who's at the University of Newcastle, who sampled these, these middens at an earlier stage of excavation. Um, so that's other work, other micromorphologists that we're dovetailing with. You can see some lovely, lovely sort of stratification, amazing, amazing living sequences. Loads and loads of stuff happening in there. So what is the sampling strategy? So we want to be representative of a range of different spaces or potential use areas within the structures. So halves, where you walk around the halves, where you come in and out, the recesses, bits that are used more and bits that are used less, and we want to see differences between those. We want to be as representative as possible of the stratigraphic sequence. So as you go down, so not just the building one phase as it was used, but what's happening through different phases. You know, that's happening now. You know, some of, the, some of the samples I'm taking, I don't know what phase they are yet, but the idea is that we try and work, get samples from each phase as we go down to it. And obviously, that's responding to the excavation program as it's going. So the really important thing is me not coming in and grabbing some samples, but actually working with the excavation team and being part of it, basically. So, how representative is that? You've got a tiny tin of soil, like that big, a massive structure or you know, just one massive deposit but in itself it's not particularly representative and that's why it's really important for this kind of technique where you have a tiny sample to work with the excavation the excavation team but also the other environmental sampling strategies and protocols that we have so at nest for example on the floor surfaces especially there is a very strict and very all-encompassing kind of sampling program the floor surfaces sampled intensively on a grid system, 100% of the floor surface is taken. On each, on each grid square, 50 centimetre grid square, you have a sample of geochemical analysis and the rest of the material goes into a box sample. So I know where my samples are from, we're working with the excavation team. So my evidence in that tiny tin is very precise, is very contextualised, but it doesn't have that breadth. It doesn't tell you, I mean, it, the tin may have looked slightly different by taking it two centimetres to the left. So what we do to truth that is to make sure that this evidence are all the inclusion of bits and bobs we see and environmental processes. We pair that with the box sample environmental record, which may not have that information in context, but it does have the breadth and the completeness. So hopefully that gets us a bit nearer to what was actually happening. Anyway, so... That's the strategies. Let's talk about NES itself. So, one of the main things we've been looking at using the micromorph is floor surface construction. So, everybody knows how beautiful the NES structures are, and they're all made of sandstone. Lovely sandstone, dressed and decorated, and different colours, and it looks great. And there they are. But those superstructure elements are not the only bit of building that happens at the NES. So, you make the walls, but you also need to make the floors. And that is kind of where the traditional excavation method kind of stops once it's identified the floor. We can't examine the floor surfaces in a great deal of detail in excavation. We can see what they are. Yellow, hard, clay silt, yellow floors, frequent sandstone fragments, and that's as far as it goes. And we've been hoping that the micromorphology 
can help us understand a bit more about how these floors were constructed, whether there were different recipes for different types of floor, whether we see variation, and if we do see variation, does it make sense? Does it mean anything? Or is it just variation? Here's a good example, structure 14. Maybe you can just see the yellow floor at the top of that tin. That was that tin. Later phase floors in structure 14, which has now, now been, uh, post excavation is finished. Later phase floors in structure 14, plate 14C, were characterised by these yellow plate floors. The earlier phase, beaten earth, round earth floors, as Hugo would have it. And you can see that there. Here's the later phase, and here's earlier, an occupation deposit, and that comes through to there. You can see how much they stand out when they morph, that you can see the structure, see thickness, you can see the mineral clay silt structure of them, but you can also see these little sandstone fragments that are in them. I'll use, use my come to get a closer look at them. Similarly, back to that structure one sequence, loads of clay flows, loads of different clay flows. And in tandem with the occupation, episodes of occupation that came in between each of these flows. So, what we see in them? Um, fine silt, fine sand flows, generally rounded, but we get some really nice square ones. Small sandstone fragments, they vary in size, shape, texture, we've got coarse sort of finer grained rock fragments. Some of the layers have a lot more pebbly, pebble sized sandstone fragments than others. Lots of these sandstone fragments show a lot more iron enrichment and depletion. You know, when they, this, 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 and that one there, that's iron depleted. Iron has moved through this, remember the sandstones themselves are tiny little, generally quartz. Um, mineral grains packed together with cement. The iron down profile moves through those as well. I'm quite interested in that because some of the sandstones look more iron affected than the matrix which surrounds them. So I'd like to see whether we can tell a bit more about how the two elements mix together, the actual crushed pebbles and the silt and clay that go together. We mix them up and make the floor. Some of these clearly, the sandstones are from a different area. They, they, they have been affected by iron before they went into the made it into the floor. So, yeah, little things we can start telling about them. Some of them are extremely keen. Others have got lots of microcharcoals in them. There's no diatoms, really. Food, so we're not really seeing a marine element to the clay that's been used to compose them coming in. That's what we can tell at the moment, because we need to take more samples. We're at an interim stage with this. But you can hopefully can see the kind of contribution this could make. Here's, here are some of the ones across colours. You can see, yeah, you can see how varying they are. So that's like more, you know, it's mainly quartz grains there. You can see the odd bit of mica coming in there. Some of them are really fine, they're more, more like siltstone. Some of them have that sort of schist schisty kind of texture where you can see the sandstone bedded in a certain way. Really iron rich ones, it all varies. So perhaps to build up a picture, like I say, we were at interim stage, hopefully, once we have gone through a lot more of these floors, we might be able to start matching up with the archaeology. Um, but that is not the only kind of surfacey type material that we see. Um, we see it on site. We don't just see yellow clay floors, we see grey surfaces and white surfaces, clay, powdery ones. Things that aren't occupation deposits, they're not full of charcoal, they're not that lovely little sort of prowling type deposits. They look pale, they look like floors, they look like the yellow, but they don't have a sandstone on them, they're clearly not solid or durable enough to be floors. One sample that we've taken, that I'll be talking about, about a bit later, has both of these kind of the type, two types that I've seen, which has been great. Um, Grey, white, fine, silk clay, and across polis. There's not a huge amount of difference apart from the lighter coloured ones seem to have more rock fragments in them. And they tend not to be sandstone either. That is a like a compound quartzy kind of kind of rock fragment there. Not not sandstone. Um, I've also seen this kind of material pop up just in the and folk that I talked to that are digging as well, I've seen the same thing. Lumps of grey clay, almost as if it's been rolled. Is some of this material for preparing, for potting, you know? I took one sample which had a lump like that and specifically so cut the sample here. It looks very similar to the lower clay you see in there. It's got a bit more clay, loose clay movement in it. You can see biofringes of clay that all lined up the same way. Maybe it has been rolled. So again, see, we're exploring all these different things that are popping up. At macro level, we also see this stuff. Um, the structure, that's a deposit of this white grey clay. 
very lucky to be in marine clay, above this more powdery, yellow, silty stuff, which we've got a lump of in structure 10. We could have a close up, it doesn't have those lumps of sandstone in it. It's not surface, it's going to be there for something, but it's not going to be in surface. So, explore, explore. Um, but, I thought the rocks that don't belong, I was saying about Martha's project, and the rocks that aren't sandstone, these volcanic dike rocks, they are not there, they are not in the yellow clay floors, and they are not in these other prepared surfacey type minerals, mineral layers either. Here's a selection of the many examples of the little bits of dike rock that I've seen in samples of all of them are in the occupation deposits, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So, I guess what we can say so far, and Martha likes this too, um, is that these volcanic dike rocks that were deliberately brought to the Nest Broadga and have been used in some cases and in other cases just placed in the structures for reasons unknown, whatever they were brought here for, they were not brought here to be incorporated whether for a practical or a less practical purpose, they would not want you to be incorporated into the constructed surfaces. So that's something we know. Anyway, so moving on to the floor surfaces, what's on the floor surfaces, the occupation related deposits, um, evidence for human activity. And in a way, there's not a huge amount of actual detail, but I can, again, we've got a few, we've got a relatively small amount of sample to process. We're seeing tons of stuff, it's all very interesting. We are beginning to build stories, but we need more samples to build them coherently, in a way. We obviously see loads of peaty char, char charcoal, less charcoal, stuff with a, you know, which is obviously what we would expect in this context. Burned peat is the order of the day. Um, we've also seen a fair bit of turf. There are little bits of turfy lumps turning up in quite a few of the deposits, so another fuel source. Burnt peat, classically burnt peat, that we can identify stringy structures. If we can't really identify it, if it's just a lump, we tend to call it char. If we could say, oh yeah, that's really peaty. It's quite nice to be able to identify that. Loads and loads of burnt peat. And then burnt peat, obviously, floor surfaces, accumulations, then burnt peat fragments, various colours, some of it really mashed, some of it a little bit more structured, some of it decayed. So, all of this appearing in all the occupation deposits that we get, more often than not, in this kind of mashed up, um, degraded, but also trampled um, kind of structure. And like I say, as we build up more of a picture, get more samples, I would like to think that we can use that for interpretation alongside the other environmental samples, but also looking at patterns of walking through the structures, how things were trampled in, Having whether things were cleaned, brushed, taken away. It's a really good indicator for that. Another thing we're obviously seeing loads of is bone. And one of the things I've noticed so far about the sample set we have is that it's all the structure eight. There's, there, are, there are little bits of bone here and there and everywhere. But structure eight, we have four samples from structure eight, and pretty much all of them show a lot of bone. So that's, that's quite interesting, especially because of what we can talk about in a minute. And then we've got other processes, other stuff going on. Um, some of these soil processes I was talking about, we see a lot of these clay, silt clay movement features, disturbance, obviously the whole thing is, you know, all the, all the occupation deposits you'd like to think of are walked on, disturbed. But when we see patterns of more of that happening, um, that's one of the things that we would like to look at in more detail, looking at patterns of that, of those kind of soil pedal features as they come up and kind of tying them in with the excavation. Um, detail. So to just kind of sum up all that, you know, that kind of what we can see from the occupation bits. Um, relative sizes of fuel residue fragments. So far, so far from the, like I say, the, the samples we have, it seems that the deposits nearer the heart show finer, more crushed fuel residue profiles. And the larger bits of burnt peat char are more frequent within the areas that don't have so much walking around in them. Makes sense to a certain level, but you would think there would be a lot more stuff just going into the areas around the hearts. So we've seen cleaning, concentrations of activity, whatever, that's interesting. The bone seems to follow this pattern. There's fewer, there are fewer bones, very little bones seen in context adjacent to the heart. But those phosphatic features I was talking about earlier on, sort of like the yellow, you know, stainy bits that you can see, they are really quite common throughout the sample set. So are we seeing? 
when it comes to really, really tiny bits of bone, are we seeing complete or near complete degradation of the very small bone fraction? This may be a, a common process that we're not necessarily picking up on. And bone more prevalent in the structure exam so far, so far. So, we, as I keep saying, we've only got a small number of samples processed. So, what we've been doing in terms of, in terms of um, interpretation, looking at, at the analysis so far, is kind of focusing on inter interpreting individual sample areas, individual little scenes that we can see, rather than trying to make these big pronouncements about what might be going on in this structure versus this structure. We just aren't in a position to do that yet. So, various things we talk about here, but I do not want to go on like so. Here's one example. Um, structure one is the later phase sequence. We've got those samples I've talked about there. We also took one from next to the half here. A small interesting point, for example. I think we've shown, shown you. Here's that sample. Really nice, really lovely sample. Um, and you can see those little char rich half stains coming up from the half. You can see at least two of those in that top sample preserved quite clearly. Um, so I've been focusing in on little areas like that where we do have you know, a good range of information for a really small area. So for example, for this second phase half, um, those, two, those two areas, it looks like the same stuff. It certainly looks like the same stuff in excavation. They're a little bit different when you get them under the microscope. This lower sample is quite phosphate rich. It's got lots and lots of little bits of phosphate through it. Degraded bone, just phosphate, poop, who knows done from the fire, we don't really know, we can't see down, we don't need to see any of these, those calcitic sterilites, those things that identify down, we can't see any of those anywhere. The upper horizon is just more unburnt peat mixed with char, they're quite different. So, so these, it's an exam, a small example of how these two little deposits right in this one little area are actually quite different. And that's the kind of thing we've been focusing on so far for, for this, for our interim, um, with the samples we've got. So, there's one of those little focuses that I want to talk about, and that's when I'm going to finish. Um, I want to talk about it in a bit more detail because it's interesting and because it's kind of happening now, really. Um, activity in structure eight. So this is a simple, a simplified sort of view of structure eight. Um, and what I want to talk about is the modified recess, which is the one the person in black excavating on the top. So structure eight recesses, two big halves at either end, smaller half settings, some of them with halfy stuff in them and some of them not within the structure, so that's the layout, and here are the recesses. Um, I want to load samples through structure 8, and my aim was to get into the recesses as well as everywhere else. You can see that modified recess highlighted there, and I've got one sample process from that, um, and other samples. Kind of, we can see that there are a couple of samples missing from the recesses there. Um, I'll say why in a minute, but yeah, that modified recess, really interesting. Um, architecturally really interesting. That one area there, that's what it looks like. That's what it looked like when I took a sample of it. And you can see that there's one of those little epoxy kiss type possible halves just outside it. And the recess itself is demarcated by the author stat on end. And if you look closely, you can see where it's been drawn in there. Um, the author stat itself has got two little cat flaps. I thought of it like that, so to speak. Two little flues probably the thing that I think would be closest to sort of saying they could be two little holes cut through clearly and deliberately. deliberately. You can see that is the interior of it. That's sort of again how it looks. There's a broken bit of stone but that's how they look. So two little two little holes going into the recess. And that's how it looked when I sampled it in 2015. Um, and I got a good sample from there. Unlike the other recesses, most of the other recesses where I came down onto stone, absolutely every most frustrating process. I got one from there, but the rest all completely different in this one recess. And, well, the reason for that we kind of knew really because the stones were popping out all over the place while I was trying to sample. These other recesses never seem to have a floor at all. And the sort of working hypothesis, as I understand it, is that they were probably raised platforms, probably used. Underneath structure eight are two other structures, earlier structures which eight was built over, and it's material from those earlier walls and their demolition process that are still there, just kind of cluttering up those recesses. They couldn't have been used at that level, they must have had um, platforms, and I've been, as a result, very unsuccessful at getting samples from them. But the modified recess was a completely different kettle of fish, and we got a lovely sample from there. 
as you can see, and I was very excited to see this lovely grey clay popping up at the bottom of it. So we made sure we certainly we processed that one. And that's the one I showed you earlier with these two different types of really fine grey white powdery lovely clay with really not much in the way of well temper would you call it anything that would make it a floor surface suitable material so great and the other reason it was interesting is this the particular recess is that when professor scott pike from lama university who was here every year um, to undertake geochemical analysis program when he um, undertook multi-element analysis of structure eight we had a huge spike in phosphorus from that particular recess and nowhere else. So this was a really interesting little spot. So looking at that slide, as we've already talked about, I was really interested in the differences between these two clay silt deposits. And that's something we're still working on, looking at, at other areas of the site where there's popping up, etc. etc. But above that was also a really, really interesting thing. You go into you have an occupation type deposit kind of just in between those two clays, then you go up into other layers and layers and layers of occupation related deposits, stuff full of peat and char and unburnt peat and all sorts of stuff within a generally organic soil matrix. But one particular lens there was absolutely full of these phosphatic staining features. Some of them really iron rich, some of them less so, and char and tiny, not much bone actually, but then we start to see a couple of little bits of bone. And that was, yeah, here managed to get a good photograph of one of these little bits of bone degrading. Actually, so here's a bone fragment, and you see the end is actually just degrading into that phosphatic material. So there's a close up of the end of the bone. So that's where these stains come from. It's bone basically. So, hence, phosphorus is that's quite quite logical explanation for Scott's high phosphorus reading from that, that, um, from that little recess. If you think back to what I was saying about the other, uh, the other samples in structure, of all the samples, they're bone rich anyway. So that's interesting. Why would you not get high phosphorus from other areas? I don't know. Um, but anyway, that particular, um, yeah, that particular lens is probably the reason for that phosphorus. Looking at it in a bit more detail, something else that's really interesting popped up, and that's why I can kind of look at this a bit more, and I want to get another sample, because just below those phosphorus-rich bits, phosphate probably, um, you've got that dark bit there. Close up of that, you've got PT char and um, bits, of, bits of unburned peat and bits of sandstone and all the rest of it. But this one particular piece of sandstone here had a big vitrified fragment in it. You know, there's that comparison that one from sandy, really highly heated bit of vitrified glassy material, dirty organic stuff with some really highly heated mineral in a bit of peat that hasn't been burned. That's not such a usual feature really, so I don't know. I don't know what's going on there, but it's a very interesting little sample sequence. So, um, here is that, that little, that little recess now, this year, a few days ago. We're now sampling below that level. My sample point is somewhere, somewhere here. I think you can just see it. <coughs> I want to get another sample now that we are below the layer of, obviously, all that organic material and stuff that presumably was the high phosphorus reading, responsible for the high phosphorus reading, and below the clay. And as you can see, just as in the other, other recesses, now the, 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 the material the structure from the earlier building is popping up. But we've still got a decent amount of material and this grey clay stuff. I showed you little bits of grey clay coming up at the lower level as well. So I want to get another sample of that and then we'll see where we'll go. In the meantime, Scott, Professor Scott Pike, did another multi element analysis on the lower part of that and we had low phosphorus. So it works, that's great. Um, another indicator that that, that that peat, char, phosphorus rich, that phosphate degraded bone rich bit was that's responsible for that reading and we want to look, look at why it's got vitrified high temperature material in it. Why is that? I don't know. Um, we think that, that particular recess is obvious an area with special things happening in it. You've got the, that all the start with the holes in it. Are they flues? Are they trying to keep stuff dry or warm? Are they heating stuff in there? The little box kiss type thing outside is not, it doesn't have half material in it. 
So we don't know, but it's really interesting. All oh, that that morphology profile there is really interesting. So in the next couple of days, we'll get another sample from there at a lower point where we know there's low phosphorus, and we'll take it from there basically. So I'm going to leave it there as a, a good example of how we are using this technique in tandem with stuff that's going on in the excavation, as well as trying to answer bigger questions about what's happening next. Um, I just want to say thanks specifically to the Society of Antiquities of Scotland who funded some of, this, at least some of the sort of slide processing at an earlier stage. So many, many great thanks to them. And then, of course, thank you for the Internet's Brook project, Sock, Sock Ants, and to Open Archaeological Society for asking me to come along. So that's it. Thank you.